Diana Cox Foster, who, let's see here, is the research leader at the USDA B Lab once again. And before serving here at her in her current role, she was the research leader at Penn State University. Her research focuses on biotic and abiotic stressors on bee health and quickly becoming a friend of the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food and a friend of the bees. I welcome Diana cox Pasha. So it's my pleasure to, to join back at the conference here. So I thank uh, Stephen and everyone for inviting me for the second year here in a row. And uh, as you learned, I uh, got to join uh, the Utah, uh, the Pollinating Insect Research Lab, or PIRU, as we call it the short form, uh, about two years ago. So just to give you a little bit of my history, I grew up in Colorado, so I am a Westerner. I come from a long lineage of pioneer families. I actually did kindergarten down in, in uh, Monticello, so a little bit of Utah early on. But I was a professor at Penn State University for 28 years and um, uh, got caught up in honeybees and colony collapse disorder. So I was the co-leader of the research done way back then. But I had the pleasure of joining an excellent team of scientists out here, wherever Jamie disappeared to, there he is, as others here that I'll refer to. So. As Jamie gave you a great introduction here, well, I'll give you a little bit more here. So we have incredible bee diversity globally. There's about 20,000 species at least, probably many more out there, and 4,000 plus in North America. And as Jamie showed you, we're right in the hot spot of diversity here. And um, for those of you who have been in bees for quite a while, you know that they were actually introduced species into the United States, that the colonists brought them here originally. And we've taken them as human beings, we've taken them globally around the world. There are walking, flying, movable insect livestock, and very ideally suited for pollination where you have a large acreages of crops blooming and not much else around and you need to get bees in there to do pollination, you can bring in your honeybees and have them work very efficiently. We've also made use of them over uh, way back before Christ in Israel, you can find the oldest apiary that's about 5000 BC, where they had over 100, 200 colonies right in the med center of their village. So when you have cities that complain about beekeeping, we need to remind them that we had them way back then. And it's primarily for our sugar production, our honey was it, and still, honey is still highly treasured worldwide. As such, honeybees, but also these other bees are the keystones in our food supply and environments. But what do I mean about that? So if you look at an archway, especially like Roman archways, you'll see this little triangular stone that's placed at the very top there. That's called the keystone. And Jamie, growing up in Pennsylvania, knew it's called the keystone state. If you have that stone in place, it holds the arch up there and it keeps it stabilized. If you pull that stone out, the whole archway collapses. So these bees are actually one of the species that supports a lot of our food supply. If we didn't have honeybees and many of the other bees, we would all be eating grain and corn and potatoes and being totally bored and missing many of the essential nutrients and vitamins that we need. Out in the natural environment, there's over 80% of the plants out there that depend upon these bees as pollinators. So having them and keeping their populations healthy is very important. I also need to point out that up in Logan, one of the the saving graces that we have there is that we're the only ARS lab that gets to work on all the bees. And we're the home of the U.S. pollinating insect collection. So we have two systematists in place helping to identify and figure out who are all the bees that we have. And we also are uh, now getting into doing molecular keys for those. And we can also use it to figure out who are invasive bees that are coming in that 
like the potential for Apis serrana or Apis dorsata or many other bees coming in to displace others. So hopefully you'll get to hear some of my other scientists talk about the diversity here. There's brand new bees also popping up all the time, new species. We have discovered in the last year or so that there's a bee that makes its home in sandstone and actually digs in nests in sandstone. So it's really cool. But I'm going to tell you about health of bees. So as you may have heard and know, these honeybees have been in trouble for a while. It was 2006, 2007 when the first beekeeper said there's something really funky going on here. I'm losing a whole apiary that was previously two weeks ago really healthy and happy. It was, we came up with the title name Colony Collapse Disorder because we didn't know what this was. We couldn't recognize it. Those losses have continued on. So you can see over on the left-hand side, at that time is about 30% annual loss during the winter time. And some beekeepers experienced even higher losses of 80 to 90%. And as uh, one of my previous students, Dennis Van Engelstorp, has gone on to create his own uh, illustrious career, he's the person who manages the Bee Informed Partnership. That's a site that you guys can go and look on on the web. And it has some great bee information there about diseases and just blogging and that. Um, they partnered with APHIS to do the National Bee Survey and sent out these surveys nationwide. And what we've seen is that it's not only winter loss. A lot of the commercial beekeepers and many other sideliners said, wait a minute, you're ignoring something. We used to have all these healthy bees in the summertime and be building up our colonies and splitting them. We're starting to see that we're losing colonies in the summer. So you'll see that there's this total annual loss bars here, the darker orange color that was added in. All of a sudden it became clear that many of these beekeepers across the country were losing 50% of their colonies. And these were from well-established commercial beekeepers that had this long lineage of very successful operations. They knew what they were doing, had handled a lot of things, and we're seeing this. So things have gotten a little bit better here with the winter loss, but we're still seeing these high levels. It's not just honeybees, too. So Jamie talked about some of the declines here. But just to remind you, this year for the first time, up at the top left-hand corner, we've had a bee, the first bumblebee, added to the endangered species list. So the rusty patch bumblebee is, is our poster child for that. And it used to be one of these very predominantly distributed bees. And Jamie would tell you the exact distribution. I think they're mainly now found up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, the last remnants. But they used to be down through uh, over into Virginia and that, I think, as well. And there's a few others that probably have gone by the wayside here. Franklin's bumblebee and this variable uh, cuckoo bumblebee haven't been seen for over 10 years. But this one's down here at the bottom, and Jamie mentioned the Bombus occidentalis and the Bombus pensylvanicus that used to be very widely distributed, and their numbers seem to have disappeared. So his, what did you call it, be aware? Bumblebee, Bumblebee watch. Part of the taking the pictures here is to help figure out exactly what's going on. And to give Jamie credit here, he's one of these people that gets to work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies to figure out um, what the status of the bees are and if they need to go forward. So Xerces Society has put forward petitions, and I think they're actual legal petitions, to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to have five species at least put on the endangered species list. There are seven other species in Hawaii. There are solitary bees that have been added to this as well. But there, those other bees that we talked about, those other 4,000 species out there, many of these are the bumblebees, but many of those are solitary bees. The problem is with solitary bees is they like to nest, as its name suggests, as single bees nesting out there. We don't often know where they're found, and we don't have people out there looking for them, watching them. Bumblebees have to mat admit they're one of my favorite bees because they're really big and beautiful and glorious. 
But these other bees play very critical roles as well. So we do think that there are declines in bees. So with honeybees, we can actually have colony in place. You can go out and look at it day in and day out. And it's really fun to do that. And you can see how healthy it is. So we've actually had a lot of experiments done globally, especially with colony collapse disorder and, and debates going on and veromite showing up. And what I'll tell you today is it's not a simple answer. It's like Jamie said, it's a very complex issue that there's more than one thing happening. We need to call them the four Ps here. And if we could figure out where variable climate, i.e. climate change, fits in there. That might be another one to stick maybe at the stem of the flower here. But pesticides, parasites, <coughs> poor nutrition, i.e. not enough flowers, and pathogens. And the reason I have them overlapping is we now know from many experiments done globally that this is where we get each of these interacting with one another. And to make it even more complex, we can find within the groups here, like amongst a myriad of types of pesticides, that they can interact with one another on bee health, as well as parasites and pathogens. So I'd just like to lead you through some of these and talk about my own research in part here as well. So the four parasites here, when we talk about honeybees, the veromite over here at the top left is a very specific pathogen to honeybees or other related apis species. We're not going to see it hopping over onto bumblebees or others. But it has probably created a lot of the major problems we see in the honeybee industry. So it showed up in the late 1980s. And as Jamie said, it moved rapidly. So within a year or two, it went from the east coast to the west coast. And if you haven't yet encountered what it can do, and you probably are encountering it. it. It has changed the whole landscape of honeybee keeping. So my great-great-grandmother used to be in Colorado, one of the Colorado honey producers. And I found, you know, this cool little picture of her holding a swarm up with this simple veil on. And I think, you know, that was their income for my, my grandparents, great-grandparents way back, was to grow honeybee colonies and get the honey. But, and for the commercial guys around here, if you ask them now how easy it is, most of the ones I know, it's like, you know, they're considering either who to sell their colonies to one day, because they really like their bees too, and it's a hard decision, or how are they going to stay in business, because they're putting a lot more money into it. It's just much, much more difficult, mainly because of this pest. So the one next to it here, the triple A lapse, I called it the evil that lurks. This is sort of like the monster in the closet. This is a really bad mite. This is worse than the varroa mite will be. The reproduction of this mite exceeds that of varroa, and it, right now it says that, yes, it can do everything that varroa does, spread the disease, and that. And uh, the recent meeting that I was at with the Entomological Society of America, there was a symposium brought together global researchers. This mite is now spreading throughout Asia and it's hopping from one species of bee to another. So learning what it looks like and what it looks like on the brood is really important for you as beekeepers too because you may be the one that discovers it and if you see something weird, calling these guys is extremely important. And that's partly what their APHIS survey and getting them out there with all the inspectors to do is just to catch this. Because if we could stop this when it gets to the United States, it's not if it will get to the United States. When it gets to the United States is really important. So I'll get off that soap opera there, or <laughs> the grandstand. The Varroa, um, we now know that it can spread the diseases. It's a vector of diseases. And um, it somehow changes the behavior of the diseases in the colony. My research said that it immunosuppressed the bees, bees, bees immunity, that we see all the diseases, including bacterial and uh, many of the virus diseases, go way up in incidence. And I still believe that it does do this. And um, that's one of the things to watch out for. 
The other thing is that Vro itself has become resistant to many of the mitocides. So at this current point in time, and I think every of the beekeepers or the experts I've talked to, fluvalinate and cumafos, it's just basically you might as well take the, the 50 pound bag of chemical and drop it on the mite to kill it. The chemical itself, the bees, the mites can exist on. It's not gonna have any impact. Amitraz, there's also resistance showing up with it. So we're left with oxalic acid and some of the other control measures. But the important thing here, work that's been done by Dennis Van Engelsdorf and also some by Gloria de Grandy Hoffman, now shows that if you have untreated colonies where the mites have been building up and the colony dies, those bees in that colony with all the mites on them, like over here, if you've, anyway, these little, If you see the mites on the bees that bad, you've got it really, really bad. Those bees just don't stay placed. They're flying out to look for other colonies. And so Dennis's study showed that the bees, because they marked them a lot like what Jamie talked about, they flew three miles away and it ended up in other colonies. And there's commercial beekeepers out there and others who have been closely monitored colonies like going through the whole season without any mites or very low number of mites and all of a sudden, boing, get a huge amount of mites in there. Suggesting that this is one way that you can have mites moving around. So for all the new beekeepers that are out there, and it's a good thing that they're there, but we need to educate them that they need to keep their varroa under control because this is one of the ways to move all the viruses and many of the pathogens about is using this mite. Okay, so next on to our next P, the poor nutrition. So one of the things that's clear here in the United States is that we've lost a lot of our floral resources. So many of the areas up in the Midwest, northern Midwest, have gone from um, these metal lands where people would take their bees and make large honey crops, now to being put into corn or other crops and we've lost a lot of that. We've also cleaned up a lot of our environment. So thinking about as a kid, you know, driving along the roadside, you'd see all these flowers, i.e. weeds, blooming out there along the roadside. We've cleaned up a lot of those areas and uh, we need those floral resources. So planting those seeds and encouraging people to plant flowers that blooming all season long is extremely important. So it's not just having enough flowers, it's having diversity of flowers. There's a lot of new research suggesting that pollen varies from one flower to one flower in terms of its nutritional value. And some of that nutritional value is not only the protein in there, but also fatty acids. And it turns out that having a diversity of fatty acids, so like when we, I haven't listened to enough TV these days, but omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids, Turns out bees need those too. So having diversity is really important. So research has been done showing that if bees just have a monofloral diet, i.e. just one crop, one type of flower, they have a lot poor of social immunity. The enzymes and the uh, factors that are passed from bee to bee than those that get a polyfloral diet. So part of maybe Jamie's bees leaving the greenhouse to go elsewhere Tomatoes is pretty much a monofloral diet. So they might have been out about looking for that. But it's also the necessity of protein. So one of the bees that we have here in, in um, Utah are these solitary bees at the top here. They've been marked. They don't normally come with little red dots on their back. This is the Osmia californica. It's a stem nesting bee. You would find it up in the mountains. And uh, one of my researchers, Jim Kane, showed that yes, you could have bees perfectly happy surviving on sunflowers which have been bred to be pollenless. So if you go buy sunflower seed, many years ago I was thinking, yeah, this is great. But it's really hard now to find the sunflowers that have pollen. You have to go buy the ones where you intend to harvest the seeds out of them. Many of the others are bred just for the beauty of cutting the flower, because a lot of the home gardeners didn't want to bring the sunflowers in to have them little dusting of pollen all over their tables. 
But if you don't give them the flowers with the pollen, what you see is the bees live, but they don't make any eggs. And if you don't make any eggs, if you're a female bee, you don't have any babies. You don't have any babies, that's it. That's the end of the line for that particular trait. So having this pollen is really essential. He also showed that many of the bees, the other native bees that are solitary, need that pollen right away to get out. So they're actually eating this pollen to nourish themselves as well. So just to show you these pictures over here, this is the inside of a bee. This are her ovaries. This is where she's making the eggs. So down in here would be an oocyte and forming that there. So if you think of it, she's producing one or two of these oocytes, these eggs every day. That's basically, she has to eat a lot of pollen to get that protein in there and make everything. The other thing that's come out this year, that yes, changing in our climate is making a difference. So as you know, CO2 levels have been going up. There's this cool paper here where they went back to herbarium specimens from the Smithsonian and looked at goldenrod. And what they showed is over time, you could take these, you could see that the amount of pollen protein that was in that pollen was going down. It was correlated with CO2. They didn't just do this correlation, they actually did an active experiment. They took plants and grew them under specialized little tents where they could control the CO2 and showed, yes, indeed, that if you change the CO2 levels, it affected the amount of protein in, the, in that pollen. So it means that even the bees here, if they can find the pollen, they're going to have to go get a lot more of it to get the same amount of protein. So nutrition's important. <coughs> Okay, the other big P word, and it's the one that most people think of when they think of bad bee health or bee kills, are pesticides. And yes, you can get a direct acute pesticide poisoning. This is from a commercial beekeeper who was out in California this last spring where it's very rainy and wet and almonds. And on the almonds, they wanna keep fungus, fungus out of their trees and so you had uh, the helicopter coming in and spraying in broad daylight, 9 a.m., and the beekeepers suffered a direct bee kill, so they're dead bees outside the colonies. This is something that would be much more rare to see these days, is this direct bee kill, but it can still happen. And um, as I can tell you, the chemical, ag chemical companies are very aware of this EPA. There's ways to report it, probably back to you guys too. You guys are shaking your head, yes. So if you do see a direct bee kill, it, it's something that is reported. And there are trainings I passed on to these guys to help educate the farmers and the applicators on how to avoid this ever happening. But the other thing that was a surprise way back when CCD occurred, and other colleagues of mine at Penn State took it up, got Chris Mullen, Marianne Frazier, Jim Frazier, and several colleagues to come in was to ask what were bees actually seeing. It turns out at this point in time that the American Market, Market Basket Survey, that's where USDA lab, not ARS, but a totally separate branch, would go in and pull foods off the shelf and see what pesticides are present. Horse meat was included in the list, but honey was not. <laughs> so we didn't know what bees were being exposed to. So Chris and the others came up and came up with the methods on how to look for it. Chris was a, a traditional toxicologist and he knew about all the different chemicals that had been applied. He developed over history within the United States and other places. So there were, I think, 187 different chemicals that they looked for and metabolites or the breakdown products. And the surprise also <coughs> happened at this time is that like five years earlier, there'd been all these at labs around the country that could do analytical chemistry to figure out what was there and work with, with different chem ag companies and research groups to do these analyses. But in that five year period of time between then and CCD, they all transitioned to pharmaceuticals. So the one lab that was available was a lab 
associated with American Market Basket Survey in Gastonia, North Carolina. And they reached out to Roger Slavins, who happened to be a good beekeeper and <laughs> was excited to do this project. But the take home message was when they looked at pollen coming in, you know, three gram samples, so it's about a good quarter cup. What they found was that there were on average six to eight different chemicals at that time in a single sample. And some of the samples had 39 different pesticides in. And this is the active ingredients, what is actually put in there to kill the pests. And these pesticides not only were insecticides, but also fungicides and herbicides, and then things added to make them work better. So it read like a history book, a detail of everything. And so one thing that caught my eye were the organic chlorines, so things like DDT. DDT. This should have been gone back when I was a, in junior high school, I thought. And here it is still showing up, you know, I'm not going to tell you how many years later, but <laughs> a significant number of years later, it's still showing up and coming in. And yes, indeed, there were some of these chemicals that were showing up that were brand new ones that were systemic. So a systemic pesticide is one that is sprayed onto the plant, gets into the plant, and can get incorporated into the plant tissues, and obviously into pollen, and a little bit into nectar. So things like neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids were developed, they are uh, the group here, that react with specific receptors on the insects and other pests, but don't react with our receptors in our nervous system. Insects and us are a lot alike in many ways. And so this, this was a good thing because it meant there were lower toxicity to mammals, ourselves. But for bees, they're still highly toxic. So, <clears throat> but when we did all these analyses, and it still holds true, we can't say that one of these chemicals, or even one group of the chemicals, is associated with bee loss. So as researchers, you will not see us echoing the call to remove neonicotinoids from the market. There's still an important our, a toolbox out there for controlling insect pests, but obviously need to be used more wisely. But this pointed out that there were issues. The other concern, and this came from a meeting back in last January that was hosted by EPA, but the meeting was the registrants or the ag chemical companies asked for this. And it brought in not only EPA, but the Canadian regulatory agencies, European regulatory agencies, and the South American regulatory agencies to ask if honeybees were the best bees to do risk assessment, I, when you bring on a new chemical, you have to ask what is the risk to, to all organisms. And it goes across the board from like earthworms, fish, birds, on up. But honeybees have been added to that. And for honeybee risk assessment right now, it not only asks about acute toxicity, putting the chemical directly on the bee, but feeding it to the bee, and then also feeding it to the larvae. <coughs> So we wanted to ask, were honeybees the best? And what we came up with, and I needed to put bumblebees on here too, is that honeybees are unique. There are many other additional risks potentially to these other bees, other ways that they could get exposed. So all of them are collecting pollen and nectar. For the solitary bees, they're directly feeding that pollen and nectar to their young. They're not processing it. Honeybees is actually processed, potentially broken down, detoxified, before you give it to the larvae. For these others, they're directly giving it. But also, there's this direct contact either with soil that might have been contaminated or the leaf pieces themselves, the plant parts. And so there's a way that these bees could have added exposure. So it says, that pesticides might not only be a problem for honeybees, may, may be a bigger issue for these other bees. And as Jamie mentioned, for queen bumblebees, they go through hibernation. Many of them down in the soil could be also contacting these chemicals there. So just to show you a little bit of this, this is our blue orchard bee. This is 
Osmia lignaria. This is our native bee here that we find in the Wasatch front in the canyons. And uh, historically, this is bee that uh, many of the researchers before me and my current researchers have been getting out into commercial pollination. And I have to say that we've achieved a great deal of success here. So Teresa Pitzinger is one of my scientists has shown that this bee can be uh, co-deployed with honeybees and almonds and you get a synergistically higher yield of almonds fruit set than you would with honeybees just by themselves. They're not going to replace honeybees, but it means that the grower can get even bigger bang for their buck. We've also shown in cherries that this bee can be used there. And here in Utah, tart cherries very well. And um, I'm really proud of Teresa. She's shown that we can get nearly a sustainable production of these bees in the crop itself. So this bee here, it emerges early spring and it goes out and collects pollen and nectar. And they find these stem cavities to come back into. And this bee goes out and finds mud that it creates a little wall, brings in the pollen and nectar and lays the egg here. And then puts another wall and goes on. And so you have this extra soil there. The, the larvae grows in there grows up and in the spring it goes through the winter it goes um, it comes develops to the adult and then goes through the winter as the adult and emerge the following spring okay. so what we've seen now in some of the work that we've been doing in the lab is that if you rear this bee larvae on almond here and just water it does okay, it grows up pretty big. This is a larva down here that was the same exact age, but it was put on almond pollen with a low amount of a neonicotinoid called a sale. It's a set of metaprid. And what you can see is that it died very quickly. It's much more susceptible to a set of metaprid than honeybees are. And so it is of an issue concern there. This is one that's used in almonds for control. Another bee that we have, it's not native, but we make use of it in commercial pollination of alfalfa. It's the alfalfa leaf cutting bee. This is the bee and its relatives. There's other species that we have native here that goes out. And those of you who like to grow your roses and you see the little circular pieces cut out of the leaves. You guys seen that? This is one of the bees that does that. And what they're doing is they're cutting those pieces of here and they're creating a little cell inside a cavity. We can take x-rays of those and see what's going on there. So it brings in the pollen and nectar, it lays an egg, and it'll develop into the larvae here. And in early spring, it, it pupates and comes out as an adult. So this bee here is bringing back part of the leaf pieces. And what Teresa Pitzinger showed was that a growth regulator was used in alfalfa to control ligus and alfalfa weevil, that it persisted. So down at the bottom here, these are bees that have grown on crops without novoluron. You, here you can see the pollen and the newly laid eggs. We can see it through the x-ray. You can see over here that we got the larvae. If you look up here, those treated with this chemical don't develop the larvae, just die in there. And what Teresa's shown too is that this is ovicidal, that even if you take those bees and uh, put them over onto new flowers, that this chemical persists through and, they, and that the eggs that they lay don't hatch. It's been shown for other insects here at Beetle that that kills the developing baby, the embryo inside. Okay. So there are these interactions. We know that it occurs for many of the active ingredients. So it's not just an active ingredient. We know that if you go from one bag of chemical here that has the same active ingredient over here to another form of it that's sold under a different formulation, then they may be very different toxicity to honeybees. The formulation, if you look at it, is what's added to that active ingredient. So when you or I as homeowners go buy the chemical off the shelf or the grower goes buys it, 
you read the label and you see that the active ingredients may be about 3% of what you're buying. There's 97 other percent there that there are other things added in. Right now in the United States, those formulation is a trade secret. As a scientist, we cannot even find out in any way, shape, or form what those other chemicals are that are in there. But we do know that whatever's added in there makes a big difference in toxicity. There's another group of chemicals that are added in, they're called adjuvants, and I think they're mainly used in, by commercial applicators. So people who do lawn care, maybe ornamental care professionally, people that are using it in agriculture, these can add them in. And one of these adjuvants that's increased in its use is called organosilicones. And it's not only in agriculture, but you can find industrial usage, they're also used in cosmetics, unfortunately. And here you can see over here the same chemical showing up in all these different things, even like paints and many other things. This is a multi-billion poundage use worldwide every year. Okay, so just to show you this, this is California data. So California has a pesticide data registry database that any kind of usage has to be put in there. And um, what this is showing is increases from back in late 1990s through to now about 2014 here. This chemical here is the most toxic form of the organosilicone spray adjuvants. When this is added to fed to these honeybees, adult honeybees, in sugar water, it can kill them within two days. So this chemical has been increasing. Back here at this arrow, this is when CCD occurred, and so we see that this is correlated very well with the increased loss of bees. So this chemical <coughs> is not only in almonds, it's not only in California crops, this is something that's put across everything in the entire United States, so in lawn care even. And so here growers can use it, if you go but look at the label on the chemical, it says use this up to one to five percent. Don't go beyond this because it's going to kill your plant, okay? And if you look at the concentrations that are recommended by integrated pest management to be put out, it's anywhere from 300 parts per million to 5,000 parts per million. The next experiment I'm going to show you, we used it at 40 parts per million, so well below it. One of the things I've learned from being a research leader and talking to alfalfa seed growers is that they use this in each and every spray that they put out, and they're spraying it eight to 10 times per season. So the, this, the inert, may actually be of a greater concern than any of the other active ingredients. So we did an experiment. This is a grad student who's now Dr. Julia Fine. Um, and we created an in vitro rearing assay for honeybee larvae. So basically putting the larvae in as little tiny uh, newly emerged larvae into plates at little wells, feeding them royal jelly and mixtures. And so with our controls over here, Julia gets all the credit. Um, she had about 25% mortality. So there's some early death here in the red. Other points in here, so failed adult molt, a failed molt going from a larva to pupa, getting melanization of the larva to pupa, and then just other causes. The purple here is what survived. Here's when we add the OSS by itself, which is okay, not that much different. So viruses, are circulating through colonies. And as I'll tell you a little bit later, the female, the nurse bees get infected with viruses and it gets in their salivary glands. And so they're secreting it out and it goes into the brood food and in royal jelly. So we gave these bees here just a natural little bit of added virus, same amount that you would see with these nurse bees feeding them. And it did cause some increased mortality. This is what we see over here when we combine the two. The same amount of OSS, the same amount of virus. And we go from 25% mortality 
to about 75% mortality. And what we saw there is that the symptoms down here, when that death occurred, matched what beekeepers were saying they were seeing in their brood when they were coming out of almonds. Not to pick on almonds, but it's the biggest pollination event, as some of you may know, that over, I think it's like three quarters of all the colonies in the United States have to go out to California to do pollination of almonds. And it's, it's the way now that many of these beekeepers are making their livings, because you can get $150 plus per colony to do this. So we're seeing this death here. We came in to ask why this occurred. And so my specialty is looking at viruses. <coughs> And there's a whole gaggle of viruses that can infect these bees, and we looked at all of them. And one of these viruses, we saw it go way up in these bees where it had OSS and the virus together. This is a black and queen cell virus. This was the last virus I would tell you I thought would be a problem. Black and queen cell virus was reported from South Africa. We know it's globally distributed, and it's had been attributed with causing death in immature queens. And all the time at Penn State working with queen breeders, queen rarers, we had never seen it. And in fact, when we started looking at it, it was like one colony out of the whole 20 or 30 we're looking at. And we did this time after time, it was very low, so we gave up on it. And we came back and all of a sudden, here it was in everything. This virus has now gone to be the most prevalent virus in all the honeybee colonies. In the last APHIS survey that was done where it was included, and I think in two years ago, three years ago, it was in 90% of all the samples of all the colonies throughout the United States. So this is an extremely prevalent virus, and we're seeing this impact on it in particular. This one down at the bottom, we're looking at a gene that's involved in antiviral immunity in larvae. It's called 18-wheeler, whoop. I get really excited there, sorry. <laughs> it's called 18-wheeler or toll, like for whom the bell tolls. And this gene turns on when it saw the virus in just virus alone. So it did what it did, it's supposed to do. It's turning on the immune system. When we added OSS, it did not turn on. This fits the bill for being an immunosuppression. So this is why we have concerns about this particular group of compounds. We've done experiments at a whole colony level, and what we did was with a, a microcolony, we did this up in Cache Valley, and Jamie can remind me of the name of the guy that makes these cute little hives that you can link together. They're really nice. He's down in Salt Lake here. Yeah. So we did it in these cute little boxes and little kind of colonies. The reason we did that is that we had a lot fewer individuals in that colony. Honeybee colony, as a superorganism, you have resilience. You can lose a few thousand individuals and not really impact things. We took it down to the microcolony here, and the bees shifted around where we had even smaller colonies. So the little circles here are the little tiny ones. These are the intermediate and these are the bigger ones. This is showing time over here and how the bees are growing individual colonies. The controls, what we see is that, so we lost two of them, the little small ones, but even some of the small ones continued over here to grow. When we add in the organosilicone, we see that only one of them took off. When we add in a fungicide and an insecticide, that are used in almonds, we lost more. And with the others here, we see it, we also lost. But the growth of these colonies, seeing these pesticides was much less than the controls. And this is at the chemicals usage that you would see in almonds. And again, this is the 40 parts per billion, not 40 parts per million, or 100, 300 parts per million that you might see with organic silk on here. The surprise came here is that we see Many of these colonies went completely queenless, or some of these colonies swarmed. These big queens we had marked and clipped. To swarm, these bees had to get up and crawl out of these little nukes, crawl across the ground. We had them on the giant bales of hay to get them to work out there. And we'd find them out 15, 20 feet away. These bees just did not want to stay where they were getting fed this. 
So we basically call it death. This matches part of the definition of what a lot of beekeepers have been seeing, early loss of queens and having this activity of calling just leaving. And so we put it through survivorship. It came up significant for treatment. Size also made a difference. So some of those beekeepers taking colonies out to almonds, you may get split them down, get a lot more out of them. That may be part of the reason that you see issues coming back out again. But we see that the probability for the smaller sizes and having mortality is, and loss is much greater at the small size here. So we're now asking about pathogen input and what it's impacting at the gene level here. This is also not an issue for just honeybees, but we're seeing bumblebees being toxic at the 100 parts per million level in a very short period of time with these same compounds here too. So this was not a new factor. We actually go back in time. You can see people reporting that this was toxic to insects or as an insecticide. And even for this pest, this is a major pest in citrus that has been responsible for Asian or for citrus screening disease and loss of citrus in Florida. They said this is a chemical that could be used to control the solid. So this is something that is not just an inert. Okay, pathogens and parasites, as Jamie told you, there's many things out there. So a lot of these things are acquired through oral ingestion. So the fecal oral route is a, one of the ways here. So there are the bacteria, American foul brood, European foul brood are, are carried around that way. We have the nosema parasites that are acquired this way. There are other new, new group of protozoan, the trypanosomes, probably acquired that way, and then viruses. The mites may also vector it. Tracheal mite, you don't hear much about it anymore, but it probably, we had data that we never published that said it could do the same thing as row and vectoring. And the fungal spores would be ingested as well and germinate through the body here. So viruses, as I said, is one of my specialty. We now have over 18 different viruses, and this was actually like multiplied by 15 this year with a new NGS study of Australia. There are, most of them are single-stranded RNA viruses. This is electron microscope. You have to have to see them with this. These are long-distant cousins of uh, polio and foot-mouth disease virus. Um, they're only infecting the bees themselves. And they may be there at a very low level without causing problems. They've probably been circulating. They originally were called honeybee viruses, but we now know that they're not just honeybee viruses, that they infect all the pollinators. So Sacri virus here can cause this symptom of the dead larvae that's molting a pupa. Deformed wing virus can cause the wing deformity at, when it's there at very high levels. We know that these are moving around through the colony in many different ways. The queen bee herself can be infected and lay infected eggs. The workers, as I mentioned, it gets into their salivary glands. You see it in the honey, the royal jelly, and also in the bee bread. If the drone is infected, it can actually do, give the queen bee an STD. So those of you who have your queens out there, you need to educate them wisely about who to choose and do a good job. <laughs>